So our focus today is going to be biotechnology, and so um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on gel electrophoresis, um, look briefly again at karyotypes, um, and just some other various techniques that can be used um, with today's technology to analyze and to manipulate DNA. So let's do a little bit of vocabulary review real quick. Okay, so as we're looking at DNA in our chromosomes, okay, so we're increasing in size here. Okay, so if y'all remember, hopefully you remember what a gene is. Okay, a gene codes for one protein. And so it's going to be a portion of a chromosome. So in my zoomed in picture over here on the right, I can see a gene versus a chromosome. So I have my gene that codes for one particular protein right here. And you can see that's just a small section of the chromosome. So the chromosome is going to be how the DNA is packaged. And in humans, remember, we have 46 chromosomes, um, 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. And so, oh, I can't spell today. So these strands of DNA, these genes, are going to be wound tight around these um, histone proteins, and they're going to be compacted into the chromosomes. If you're looking at this picture over here, each one of these would be what look like a little bacterial cell. Each one of these would be a chromosome. Okay? And then all the chromosomes together is the genome. Okay? So the genome is going to be all of the DNA of the organism, all of the chromosomes of the entire organisms. Okay, so the gene is the part portion that's coding for one particular protein. The chromosome is going to be made up of lots of genes. Okay, you can see that here. It's made up of lots of genes. Okay, you can have thousands of genes on one chromosome. And then the genome is going to be all of the chromosomes in that organism. For instance, the human genome, there's 46 chromosomes. So we talked about karyotypes on the last video, so we're not really going to spend a lot of time on them. Remember, they are the picture of the chromosomes. Okay, remember, we stain them. They, uh, those banding patterns show up with the stain. We pair up the homologous chromosomes, okay, and then we line them up tallest to shortest. Remember, uh, pairs 1 through 22, those were what are called the autosomes or the chromosomes that code for essentially everything in our body but gender. And then the last pair will either be XX or XY. So if they're XX, they would match. XY, they would not. But those are the sex chromosomes for gender. Okay? And again, these can be used to show mutations, um, genetic disorders, you know, looking for those monosomies, the trisomies, the non-disjunctions. So we'll be analyzing some of these coming up in class. So chromosome painting is another um, form of DNA analysis. Okay? Um, the, it's also called fluorescence in pseudo-hybridization, or FISH. Okay? So this is our chromosome painting. So with the chromosome painting, basically we're using fluorescent markers, and they dye the chromosomes or label specific genes. So the chromosome marker either goes in and finds a specific gene, or it will dye the chromosomes. And so you can then be you can then compare either the genes or the chromosomes to one another. Okay, so the um, the fish method is like I said, it enables us to possibly diagnose genetic disorders. Okay, so you can see in this top example here, okay, they've dyed all the chromosomes here. In this one, they found a particular gene that is being isolated. And like I said, you could use these to compare them. So let me show you a picture of comparisons. So in this instance here, we're comparing these chromosomes using that FISH method. Okay, so we've got um, what looks like 10 sets of chromosomes here. Okay, and so with these 10 sets of chromosomes, I can compare them and look for differences among, I can compare the genomes of the different species, and that can help show me uh, relationships, um, in particular evolutionary relationships, how these organisms, um, what their ties are DNA-wise and DNA patterning, and you can see um, how they're similar or how they're the same. So our next technique here is called gel electrophoresis. Okay, and so gel electrophoresis uses um, this equipment right here. Okay, so we would put the gel goes right in here. Okay, so the gel goes in there, and we load the gel with little pieces of DNA. 
So you can see up here where it talks about the wells in the sample. So basically there's little holes or wells in the gel and we're going to put in little tiny samples of DNA into these holes or these wells in the DNA. And so we get these little samples of DNA by using what are called restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes look for a particular DNA sequence. Okay, so they're looking for a particular DNA sequence. So in this instance here, we're looking for this, this restriction enzyme is looking for this particular pattern. And when it finds it, it's going to cut open the DNA. And so every single time it sees this pattern here, it's going to cut the DNA. So it will end up, it can end up cutting the DNA in multiple spots. And so you end up with what are called restriction fragments. So that's our first step in our gel electrophoresis. Okay? We have to use these restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into the smaller pieces. And then once we've cut the DNA into the smaller pieces, then we're going to place it into those wells. Okay? So we'll place those little small pieces into the little wells at one end of the gel that it's going to travel through. And then we'll turn the machine on. And the machine is going to end up having a negative and a positive end. Okay, so the, the elect that's the electrical part here. Okay, I'm going to create a negative end as well as a positive end. Okay. And so I've put my DNA down here. Okay, and DNA has a negative charge. Okay, and so hopefully we remember things about negatives and positives. Okay, so DNA has a negative charge. So if I've loaded my DNA down here at this end of the gel, and I've got my negative charge at that end as well, well, negative and negative don't like each other. And my positive end is down here at the other end of the well, and you know negative and positive do like each other. So that helps generate the attraction. Okay, so this DNA that has the negative charge starts moving towards the positive end and get being repelled from the negative end. And so this charge that's generated by the gel electrophoresis machine okay, encourages the movement. Like I said, the negative DNA is attracted to the positive end and repelled from the negative end that it's at. And these little pieces of DNA, you'll notice they're different sizes here, these little pieces that are cut by the restriction fragments. The smaller the DNA is, the farther it will go. So the smaller the DNA fragment is, the further it will move through the gel. So in addition to the fact that it's moving with based on the electrical attraction, okay, it's actually also, you've got this molecule that's trying to move through a gel. It's like trying to move through relatively solid jello. Okay? And so the smaller the piece is, the easier it is for it to move and weave through that gel. So your smaller pieces will travel farther than your bigger, heavier pieces that get caught up in the gel. So our end product will look something like these, okay, all of these things here, okay, so I can see this would have been my negative end, this would have been my positive end, so these pieces down here are smaller than these pieces down here, those are my bigger, larger, heavier ends, okay, and what I've ended up here with is what's called a DNA fingerprint, because everybody's DNA is different. So these DNA fingerprints are unique, just like the regular fingerprints on our skin. Okay? And so these DNA fingerprints, these are the end product. These, banding, um, these bandings that we see here, those are called our DNA fingerprint. And like I said, they're unique to each individual because each individual has different DNA. So some reasons why these may be useful or we may uh, use these would be for things like paternity tests. Okay? So you can see here with this particular incidence, we've got... Um, the sample from the mom, sample from the child, and then there's an alleged father. Okay? And so the child you know, gets half their DNA from mom, half their DNA from dad. So every band in the child should either match mom or dad. Okay? And so if it doesn't match mom, it should match dad. So they can then determine what, um, who the father is. Okay? And so another reason, too, would be um, for this instance down here, crime scenes. Same thing, okay, we've got this sample of DNA here that was picked up at the crime scene, okay, and then the banding pattern of the suspects, okay, you can see we've got a match here, and so they could, um, and because that DNA fingerprint is uh, special and for each individual person, okay, that is a very strong evidence to link that person to the crime scene. 
So our next thing is recombinant DNA. Okay, so recombinant DNA, basically all that is, is that I have DNA that contains genes from more than one source. So I have a combination of genes. I've recombined the DNA. So you can see here I've got this uh, orange DNA that's been using those restriction enzymes. So they've went and they found the place to cut and they've cut that orange piece of DNA out of the purple. Okay, and now that orange DNA from the purple has been incorporated here into this black DNA. So this would be recombinant DNA. There's DNA here from two different sources. Okay, um, the example up here with these fish. Okay, these fish here are called glowfish. Okay, and these glowfish have mixed in with their DNA. There is um, DNA that codes for fluorescent proteins that you find in the sea coral. So it gives you these colors of these fish from the, the DNA that codes for the pr proteins from the sea coral. So that would be another example of recombinant DNA, where I've combined the DNA from two different sources. So let's look at some reasons why this could be helpful, okay, some benefits to this. So I've got, over here, I've got some crops, okay, so for instance, I've got these uh, plants here, which are susceptible to um, pest, and so this down here, this recombinant plant here, okay, is pest, um, is pest resistant, so the insects are um, not as likely to be attracted to it. Same down here, okay, with the recombinant gene here versus without the recombinant gene, Okay, these plants are more um, pesticide, insecticide, sorry. <laughs> these plants are more disease resistant, okay, and so they are stronger. Um, there's pharmaceutical uses for this. Okay, um, in this instance over here, we're producing insulin. So we take the DNA that codes for insulin production, so right there. So out of the human cell, we've cut out the piece of DNA that codes for insulin production. Okay, and we've inserted that into some bacterial DNA. So there's my recombinant there. So I've recombined the DNA from the two organisms. So now as that bacterial cell reproduces, okay, it's going to copy that human DNA too. And so those bacterial cells now have the DNA to make insulin. And so they start using it. They start making it. And this is possible because remember that universal genetic code? Remember that all organisms use the same nitrogen bases. They all use A, T, C, and G. All organisms use those. All organisms, when I have, um, let's just make one up. Let's say I have ATA, and that codes for alanine. Well, in this plant here, ATA codes for alanine. In these bacteria here, ATA codes for alanine. In this human cell here, ATA codes for alanine. Remember, all of that universal genetic code things are why this recombinant DNA can be successful. Again, the fact that all organisms use those same four nitrogen bases and the fact that the um, codons all code for the same amino acid, no matter what organism they're found in. And so the last one we have here are what are called knockout mice. Okay? And so these knockout organisms... They've had one gene, usually one gene, okay, that hasn't intentionally been removed. And so the reason we would do this okay, is if I have a gene sequence that I don't necessarily completely understand what it does, and I remove, but I know the order of it. So now I remove a section of that gene. Now I can examine the organism essentially to see what's missing to help figure out what that gene does. Uh, the instance over here, I've got this mouse on the left here, okay, is missing some of the genes for hair. And so you'll notice his hair is different than this mouse hair. Uh, again, the mouse on the left here is missing a gene that helps control obesity. So that gene has been removed from this, this particular mouse, that particular mouse chromosome. And so now that mouse, okay, we can examine the differences between a normal mouse and this mouse to see exactly what that gene did. And in this um, case, we learned that it can help control obesity. 
Okay, so we're going to be looking at some instances of karyotypes as well as gel electrophoresis and just work on analyzing these in class so we can really um, get a feel for some of the uses of these different kinds of gene technology.